process, overcoming obstacles, and their works. I hope you enjoy the show. Okay, so everybody, um, we are live on the studio today, and I'm Adam Messer, your host, and my guest today is Jim Reed, and Jim is a journalist. You're also the founder of Psychotronic Film Society of Savannah and Savannah Confidential Walking Tours. So welcome to the show, Jim. Thank you for being here. No, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate being asked. So, uh, Jim, you have been around Savannah for a long time, and just before we started the show, we were talking a little bit about your walking tour um, where you give people kind of like a um, kind of like what they're like you said what they're missing when they come to Savannah like some of the old school Savannah can you tell us a little bit more about that well sure sure um, I moved here in 86 so okay. I've, been here, I've been here quite a while yeah. and uh, I guess I'm a fixture now I'm probably glued to a wall or something <laughs> right. somewhere yeah like the green man but uh, yeah I, I started a walking tour um, about a year ago I suppose and I did it kind of on a lark. Um, it, it was something I had thought about for many years but had not uh, put into practice. And mm -hmm. a couple people who were close to me uh, whose opinions I value greatly suggested or you know, kind of prodded me to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I had no interest in a standard walking tour. There's like a 1,000 or 2,000 walking tours in Savannah. Okay. And a bunch of them are wonderful. And, uh, I mean, people should avail themselves of them. Um, but it just seemed to me that um, I, I just didn't have any interest in doing one myself and I didn't necessarily think I'd be any good at doing a right. typical walking tour. Right. Um, but what I did have or what I do have I guess is a kind of a repository of arcane <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> um, uh, my brother uh, Dave is fond of uh, calling me a genius of useless stuff which I think is a, I guess it's a reference to a, a David Lowry song. <laughs> but it, it's I'm one of those people that um, have a hard time remembering really important things that, that most people commit to memory very easily uh -huh. but, but I could talk to you for 10 minutes about some obscure thing that somebody did uh, in the 100 years yeah, ago 100 yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um I remember uh, the first time I um and this is the first time we met in person but I remember the first time talking with you and um we were doing an article in the do about your psychotronic film festival oh that's right yeah and I was like hey man you know can you send this stuff back and like you sent me like 5,000 words or something like that. <laughs> and I was like, I've only got 500 word space. Right, right. But, um, well, I probably also, <laughs> I probably also apologize for sending you so many words. Yeah, it's yeah. so funny, but it's actually, you know, sometimes more is better and then sometimes more is less, you know, it's not better. Right. Less is better, but it just depends. But I, I totally understand like, you know, coming with a like factoid type stuff, you know, cause it, it makes it interesting. It's kind of like, uh, like you ever play Trivial Pursuit back in the day? Yeah, you know, a, a long, not in a long time. Yeah, but um, I have a I have a good Trivial Pursuit story later on if you want. Yeah, to tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, Jim, uh, Sebastian, yeah. would you mind playing for us a little bit? So this is Sebastian Messer. He always uh, this is my son Jim. I, I introduced you earlier, but yeah, he yeah. always plays a little bit of metal for us while we're uh, live here in the studio. So this is Sebastian Messer. Oh, that was a quick little lick. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've only just begun to speak, and this is already my favorite interview I've ever given in my life. Um, well, I'm glad to hear that because you, you, I know you do a lot of. Uh, you actually write a lot. I mean, you've been writing for a long time, and <laughs> I do. I, yeah, I, I write a lot, and, and I've. Uh, I, so, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Sebastian, I got it. Can I? I don't know what the child labor laws are, and I don't know how old you are. But um, he works for free. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, if I could give you a stipend or something to follow me around, and I could get like a some sort of a wagon or something, and you yeah. could follow me with. We get a little pig nose amp, and you could just you could, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could you could add music to it'd my be life. The heavy metal tour, Savannah. Yeah, right? That'd be that'd be good. So, but, um, oh, but, but you well, you're asking about the the tour, I guess. Well, or? yeah. Let me. Uh, I just want to give everybody kind of like a brief overview, and we're going to dive into it a little bit sure. more. Um, the Psychotronic Film Festival Society of Savannah. So that's kind of like your baby with um, eccentric and eclectic type films and 
maybe a little more obscure type stuff. Yeah, it's a that's an organization that I've uh, that I founded and I've run for about fifteen or sixteen years, and it's a uh, it's a little it's a small sort of a homegrown uh, thing, but it, it, it's uh, gained a, a certain amount of recognition, I guess, mm-hmm. over the years uh, through osmosis. And your column, you write about a lot of uh, films and things like that that you. That's your premiere, right? Well, uh, well, it gets a little confusing. So, so I, I, I run this film society, which is mm-hmm. a community film society, and the idea behind that is um, it was designed to provide public screenings of motion pictures, feature films mm-hmm. from around the world that otherwise would probably not play, play in Savannah. In Savannah. Right. And, and those can be brand new films that are on the film festival circuit that haven't even come out yet. So in that way, uh, it's almost like a little tiny... Um, niche oriented version of say the Savannah Film Festival right mm-hmm. but it can also be uh, the selections can also be like obscure movies or even critically award winning films that go back 40, 50, 60 years so the, the whole purpose is just to provide people with an inexpensive way to come out uh, friends and strangers to meet in public mm-hmm. in, a, in a theatrical sort of environment and enjoy movies the way they were meant by their creators to be seen as opposed to on a laptop or something and there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> but, but just the idea of being able to get together and have a theatrical experience yeah. so, so there's that right uh, and then uh, part but, but aside from that although it's kind of related um, I also uh, write a column, a weekly column, which is called uh, Film Scene. Mm-hmm. And that column uh, ran for about seven, six or seven years, I think, in Dew Savannah, which is a free weekly paper here mm-hmm. in town. Um, but recently, um, I have actually I've taken that column, and it, now it's no longer appearing in Dew Savannah. It actually appears in a different paper called Connect Savannah. And Connect Savannah is uh, similar to Dew in that it's a, a weekly free mm-hmm. alternative paper. But yeah, but Connect, oh yeah, look, and there's some. There's we actually won a couple of awards last uh, last year uh, for best local radio station. Yeah, you got some Connect plaques the, uh, up there. Best talk radio. <laughs> yeah, there you so. go. Well, yeah. So so Connect Savannah is a lot like Do Savannah, uh, except that Connect Savannah <laughs> covers more the full spectrum of. It, it's more of a full focus mm-hmm. uh, alternative weekly, whereas Do Savannah specializes primarily, if not exclusively, on just arts and entertainment, like stuff to go out and do. Um, but yeah, so my film scene column is now in Connect, and it's a weekly column, and it it, it provides people an opportunity. It's sort of a one-stop shop. Like, they can right. go there, and every week they're going to get a list. It's uh, all the stuff I'm aware of. Yeah. Uh, all the notable independent or unusual or special film screenings taking place for like a week ahead. And so they can make plans to attend or, or, or do what they want with that information. Yeah. And some of those are put on by my organization, but the majority of them are put on by other organizations. I want to know, I mean, like there's like a ton of stuff. How do you find out about these different films? I mean, do people send you the information and say, hey, Jim, we've got this and we're going to be doing that? Or um, Every once in a while, I will receive a an unsolicited suggestion or something or somebody will, you know, people will uh, refer me to a film or something like that. Yeah. For the most part, um, I have for the past 15 years or so, I've spent an inordinate amount of my time um, just on my own researching and uh, uh, looking into unusual films. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I said, some of which are like incredibly obscure to the point where uh, not many people have access to the films, you know, mm-hmm. f- for either for legal reasons, they've fallen out of circulation. Sometimes they're just, uh, they were maybe released in a limited number or something. Mm-hmm. And then uh, some of the films are more widely known, but I just spend a lot, an awful lot of time uh, doing the research on them. And then when I find a film that I think will fit the mission statement of the Psychotronic Film Society, um, then if I then I'll decide. Well, do I want to actually show this film? And if I want to show the film, then I have to go through the process of tracking down who actually owns the rights to the movie, who can who controls the distribution of it, and then I have to you know find them uh, if I can. Mm-hmm. And then uh, once track them down, it's a matter of uh, negotiating with them and seeing if they will a give me permission to show the film in public, and if they will, what will they charge me for that? Right. And then it becomes a matter of can I sell enough tickets. Uh, to break even to cover the cost, and right. sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. And um, but it's a labor of love, and yeah. I, and I I've thought about stopping it before, but it, it makes a lot of people happy. And I, uh, you're the only person in town I think that's doing that. Well, I'm the only person in town that's doing that spe- specifically yeah. in the way that I do. But there are a couple of other uh, organizations or individuals in town who do similar things in, right. in that they also, uh, you know, they program unusual films and whatnot. But, um, you know, because I'm curating it, right, it's uh, it's inherently reflective on, I guess, many levels of my own, maybe not my own taste, but my own interests. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of the films that I show, um, it's a common mis 
perception, and I understand why people would think this. Uh, a lot of people just assume that if I'm showing a film through my film society, that it's a film that I really personally love. Right. And that's not necessarily the case. Right, I'm, right. I'm just sh I'm showing films that I think somebody will love, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think it would be important to give them a shot to be seen. But I'm sure on some level they they must reflect my own tastes. Yeah. Um, and then there's a, but there's a there's a great organization uh, here in town that some people may already know about called Cinema Savannah, mm -hmm. and that's run by a, a friend of mine named uh, Tomash, and he's a he's a, a like me he's an enthusiastic cinema lover and, mm -hmm. and an academic of sorts in that regard and so he programs his own film series um, and it's uh, we like to think he and I like to think that our different organizations kind of complement each other mm -hmm. and every once in a while we we join forces and we'll you know we'll work together to bring in a film that both of us like a lot or you know think I, highly I'd of. like to make a suggestion on a film yeah, that I would love to see on the big screen again <clears throat> What's when, that? I, when I was a kid I and mean, you probably remember this moving here in 86 but uh, do you remember Transformers the movie uh, with the voice of Leonard Nimoy and Orson yeah, Welles. Yes, <laughs> I do. Well, Ted Nelson. I'll tell you. So here's the deal. My younger brother Dave, uh, I think he really loves that movie because mm -hmm. he was uh, he's just a little you know younger than me, and, and Transformers were a big deal to him. I didn't really care. I was not into. You're probably a little bit older at yeah, the time. I, I was really. But do you remember how Transformers just kind of took everybody by storm? Oh, and, absolutely. Yeah. And then the movie, they killed off Optimus Prime, and it was like a big. I'm gonna know, have to take your word. Big for that. deal. Yeah, yeah. You're like <laughs> you don't know. Well, no, but, no but, but I've seen clips of it, and I, my brother loves it. And and when the when the Transformers movie started coming out, the modern Transformers movies. Yeah. I looked into. I thought it would be kind of fun to show the old animated one, but as yeah. I recall, um, it was surprisingly expensive to get the oh, rights to show gosh. it and I wound up not doing it. But Probably is, yeah, because, you know, Hasbro, I don't know who, I think it was Rhino that was doing the, the movies for the cartoons, mm -hmm. but I don't know, but that was just a personal plug for me, like saying, hey. <laughs> well, a lot of people like that movie and you're not the first person to suggest it and honestly, I would have shown it before now, but I just, if I recall correctly, it was kind of pricey and they probably jacked the price up on it because they knew that it had a, ki a kitsch factor because of the yeah. other movies coming out. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's do a station ID real quick. Um, you're listening to WRUU LP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Sundays Community Radio with Global Soul. And this is the Adam Messer Show. I'm your host, Adam Messer, and my special guest today is Jim Reed. So, we were talking a little bit about your walking tour, a little bit about the psychotronic, mm -hmm. and a little bit about your column. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people that has like five different jobs that somehow don't all add up to one <laughs> regular job. Hey, I know the feeling. I, I'm like, uh, as a creative, I do a lot of different things too. And so, you know, I think that's one of the things. I, um, I had a friend of mine last year. And they're like, well, what you know? What do you want me to put down? Because I was doing a radio show interview for them, and they were like, what do you want me to put down? I was like, I don't. I, can you just put me down as you know, just had a messer? I mean, like, I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be labeled or whatever. And like, well, people want to know, and I, and so I thought about. it. I was like, well, I'll just do author, uh, journalist, and uh, radio show host. Mm -hmm. Make it simple. But yeah, when you do a lot of different things, and I try to explain to people, I'm like, well, they all kind of go back in into the same spot, like mm -hmm. the radio show, talking with creative people doing the, the column, you know, doing the, the articles or whatever, writing, you know, it all, for me, it, it all kind of goes in the same lane, even though they're different activities, you know, it's creating and, and writing and that kind of thing. Whenever people ask me what I, uh, <coughs> you know, you meet somebody out in a bar or something and say, what do you do? And, yeah. and sometimes if I can, if I think that they're actually, they're interested and it's not just sort of a platitude or whatever, I'll right. um, I will uh, tell them, but then their eyes start to glass over like really quickly, and I and well, I feel badly uh, about it. But the, but I do. But it's like, <laughs> but once I've started like mm -hmm. explaining it, I sort of feel like well, I kind of have to see it through to the end because if I like if I stop after only one or two, yeah. you know, oh these these they'll they'll uh, they won't have a full understanding of what it is I do, yep. and so then it just goes on and on. So so sometimes if I if it seems like they don't they don't really care, I will just tell them that I'm a uh, reluctant debutante. Let's you know what while we're doing that. Let's Speaking of uh, people which I, actually which do I am. care, yeah. that people actually do care. You made a post today, and um, oh no, and we're, no. This, we're both. Oh, on, wait, this sounds bad. No, 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 no. We're both we're both friends on Facebook or whatever. <laughs> and um, I I really like this because you had a couple people like um, Kristen Stout. Mm -hmm. um, she says I don't hear you talk enough anymore, but I probably also act, uh, can't access your local radio station unless it will be available somewhere on the web. And uh, so, yeah, we're going to have that. It's available right now on the web, but we're also going to have it on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kristen used to live here in town, but she now lives far away. And so, you know. Philip Schwer said, be sure to thank 
Colonel Captain Coach Buck Von Hughes. <laughs> <No. laughs> if I'm saying it right. No, no, no. You're not, but that's all right. How do you say it? Uh, he's talking about a man named Buck Van Huss. Back, and, okay, uh, Buck Van Huss. Buck Van Huss is a... Um, I, that's funny that... You know, I haven't. I don't think I've seen Phil fa- in face to face in a long time. But, um, I guess he rem- he must remember me talking about um, uh, Colonel. <laughs> 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 he must remember me talking about Coach Buck Van Huss um, probably in the late '80s when I had just moved to Savannah. Uh, Buck Van Huss is a a, a legendary. Um, He's a legendary high school coach mm-hmm. uh, who, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for m- m- a long time, I mean decades or something, he had the title of the, and I didn't even know this was a word. Maybe it's not because it's it was Tennessee. <laughs> but uh, the winningest, is, mm-hmm. that a, is that actually a word? I don't, but I don't know. They, they <laughs> called him the winningest coach in high school. I would school. think he'd be most winning, but uh, yeah. maybe winningest, I don't know. But he was, uh, he coached at my uh my high school. Oh, okay. And he was a very, very, very big deal. And and he became a very old man, and he was still a very big deal. Um, and I remember, I think I probably told Phil some stories. I just love the guy's name, Buck Van Huss. And then, mm-hmm. you know, when I was in high school, this was in a very tiny town in the Appalachian Mountains, right? And uh, I remember, for some reason, I, I, I was not, a, this may be hard for you to imagine, looking at my physique, but I wasn't an athlete. Uh, however, I, uh, I, for some reason, I kept getting pulled out of class or something to uh, be some sort of like an unpaid chauffeur to coach Buck Van Huss. I don't know what was going on, but for some reason, they would like, I would cart him, or like in the middle of the day, I would leave high school and drive him to like go get a, <laughs> sa- go get a sandwich, go, oh. get, go get a hamburger at, pa- at Pals, which was. I bet a, you love that. Yeah. Or, or you know, you, go pick up his laundry and stuff <laughs> like that. But, but this is to tell you, this is to explain how big a deal high school sports were in my town that they yeah. would like simply select uh, probably somebody that they just didn't, they were tired of hearing me talk in school. Well. And they're like, you know, let's put him behind the wheel of oh. the car. But the funny thing was, I didn't have a, I didn't have a license. Oh, so. So, so you're driving around with yeah. no license? Wow. Yeah. I guess I could have accidentally hurt the winningest coach. And, uh, uh, well, and then um, we have uh, One of Russell. these days I'm going to have a band called Buck Van Huss because I think it's a great. That would be a good yeah. name. Russell Barclay. It says, take, eat, do this, and in remembrance of me. What is I don't know what that means. Russ Barclay is uh, is an old friend of mine. Uh, I don't by that I don't mean that he's old. I mean he is uh, known him for a while. Uh, he he w- is a former professor uh, of mine from the uh, the early days of the Savannah College of Art and Design. Oh, okay. And I believe that uh, you know Russ and I have reconnected on Facebook. And um, you know when I think of Russ Barclay, I think of a disturber of the peace. Mm-hmm. I think of a I think of a very very brilliant um, sort of a gloriously snide fellow. Uh, I am I am very thankful that our paths crossed. I wish we had had an opportunity to be in each other's company for more, you know, th- th- than we have. Mm-hmm. But I I hold out hope that it one day will our paths will physically cross again. So, but I don't know what he meant by that. I don't know either. Um. It might be some sort of MK <laughs> Ultra situation. Knowing Russ, I mean, he that that may, that may be uh, that that may be some sort of mind control cipher. And then I like this one, um, Tom Kohler. I'll be curious to see if you can work in. Psst, Hey, buddy, story in, and you go, no, Tom, uh, nope, that's for paying customers only. <laughs> well, Tom, you know, Tom is my rabbi, and Tom is. Uh, I met Tom actually at Geek. Um, the the, uh, oh gosh, what the Geek? Uh, the gosh, what was it called? A Geek Show? No, the like it wasn't <laughs> Think Geek, you, but it was. Were you, uh, were, you, were, you were you at a were geek, you at an old time geek parking end, lot? Carnival? Geek in Savannah. I oh, met yeah. him in 2014 at Geek in Savannah. Yeah, and uh, he's a he's a nice guy. Yeah, Tom is my rabbi. He's he's referring to uh, your, the listeners may hear you reading that and, and not have a you, yeah. you can't tell the context. He was just knowing that I was that you were going to ask me probably about this walking tour thing. Um, I believe what he was doing was he was uh, he was trying to see if I was going to find a way to um, sneakily mention an anecdote that I told on my tour, mm. um, but that anecdote would be extraordinarily inappropriate for commu- community <laughs> Thank radio. Thank you for not sharing it, but a lot good. of a lot of the anecdotes on my tour are are would be completely inappropriate for community radio. Oh, you know, I think that's a, the neat thing about Savannah um and the folks that I've met in mm-hmm. Savannah cuz I'm I'm a transplant. I moved down here it's not in 96 from Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. And, I've just uh, been watching a TV show that has a lot to do with Cincinnati. Oh yeah, WKRP in Cincinnati. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's a that's a great show. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was. <laughs> no, I've been no, I've been watching a show about some paranormal investigators who are based out of Cincinnati. Okay, 
Well, you know, one of the things I love about Savannah is the the mixture of folks that come here and the ones that move here and they actually love Savannah. You know, mm-hmm. like I love Savannah, you love Savannah. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I like to say, it's so crazy, but I like to say that there's like about a hundred of us running around. We bump into each other or we have different little circles or whatever. And Savannah's big enough, but small enough that you can know people without knowing them or you can mm-hmm. know of them, that kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, I, I want to hear more about the uh, je ne sais quoi or whatever it was for when you moved here and you were talking about your tour now. Mm-hmm. You go around and you kind of give some of the backstory that other people might know, not know, or, mm-hmm. you know, like your perspective of, like, you know, the time, at, you know, what was going on. So can you can you tell us more about that since we were just talking about Tom and the, sure. uh, the, yeah. the tour? And Tom is, a, Tom is somebody I met uh, so many years ago and has uh, – he, he's – in a way, Tom is uh, sort of uh, – I don't know a good way to say this. He's, he's sort of an idealized person to come and take the tour, and I was lucky that he did come and take it because he – Tom has lived here in Savannah. He was born in Savannah and, mm-hmm. and spent a lot of time here. He's seen a lot of changes come to the town. So it's – I always like when I do these tours, I really enjoy – um, if possible, it's always great to have a mixture of people on the tour where you have people who are not from here who are visiting mm-hmm. the tourists and they're just curious and want to learn something about the city. Um, maybe in sort of a raunchy or a ribald sense, which is kind of sort of what my tour is all about. But uh, it's always great when there are people on the tour as well who live here, mm-hmm. who have lived here for a great while. And because they can not only sometimes corroborate some of the tales, which sound unbelievable to other strangers, they go, no, they go, no, I think I There's remember. There's no way. I, remem- I think <laughs> like, I remember yeah. when that happened. Uh, or they have a different perspective on something, and I'll tell a, an anecdote or something from my perspective, and then they'll come up afterwards, or they'll chime in and say, oh, did you know? And then they'll. it turns out that they are aware of the situation, but from a different angle. Mm. Yeah. But, but as far as the tour goes, I just, um, over the years... You were mentioning earlier about how I uh, can be long-winded, and anybody listening to the radio right now is. Aware I didn't say of you were long-winded. No, no, no. I don't want to. No, no, I'm not putting that in. I, here. I said that you put like you gave me like five thousand words back. <laughs> right. Well, well, that's. Let's be honest. That's that's. It was six it was and a one lot half more does. than the copy I needed, but it right. was great because well, I love reading one half through does, it. Yeah. yeah. But I yeah. mean, anybody. Well, I didn't want. I didn't want to seem like I was insulting. No, you no, I, I didn't. Wasn't trying I didn't to. take it that way. I didn't <laughs> take it that way. I mean, what I'm doing is I'm insulting myself. So, but I'm aware of that. It's a character flaw, right? So I'm very verbose. Uh, I mean, I can't do math, right? But my verbal skills, or there's something going on, right? So mm-hmm. anyway, uh, the point being that, uh, see, now you got me, now, now I've lost my train of thought. Look at that. Um, <laughs> we were talking about the tour, talking about, uh, you say you could be long-winded. Yeah, <laughs> it could be, yeah. And yeah. then, <laughs> so, oh, well, so, so the idea for this tour, I, because, I'm, because I'm long-winded, mm-hmm. and, because, and because I, over the years, I've played in a lot of bands, and I've emceed events and things like this. There have been numerous uh, occasions, over, and I was on radio for a while. Mm-hmm. So there's numerous occasions over the years where I was forced, okay, by the choices I made, I was forced to find a way to get over stage fright to mm-hmm. assert, as best I can yeah. and to make myself comfortable or to give the appearance that I'm comfortable in front of groups of people, speaking right. in front of groups of people. And right. oftentimes I'm horribly uncomfortable, but it's I'm expending a lot of energy to pretend that I'm not, right? So because of that, over the years, and there's so many walking tours in Savannah and trolley tours and things, people would say to me, all different people, like friends of mine or acquaintances, they'd say, you know, have you ever thought about being a tour guide? Like, mm-hmm. you'd be great at that. And yeah. I understood why they were saying that. It's because they're like, this guy doesn't mind standing up and talking in front of people. And he loves Savannah. Mm-hmm. But I just had no interest whatsoever. It just didn't interest me. Um, I didn't even go take any walking tours. Like, it just wasn't my bag, right? Right, right. Um, but... One day I hit on this idea and I realized, you know, I, I've been here for so long. I've, I got moved here, so what, 86 or 33, quite a while, right? Mm-hmm. And I grew up in this little town in Tennessee and it was very near um, the the international uh, storytelling center, right? Okay. It's a folk, folklore center that is uh, steeped in and the whole idea is to celebrate the oral tradition, right? And the oral tradition of folklore. And so all I've ever really been about Going back to that whole uh, <laughs> genius of useless stuff thing or whatever, uh, my I have this weird predilection for just sort of collecting anecdotes and letting them sit around in my head. And sometimes they get fuzzy and sometimes mm-hmm. they get sharper. But I realize, well, I've been here long enough and I've moved around in a bunch of different sort of bohemian scenes that I had experienced a lot of things firsthand or I had close friends who had experienced stuff firsthand, which they had shared with me contemporaneously back right, in the right. day. And you just kind of hold on to these stories. And then if you're at a party or you're hanging out at somebody's house late at night, you're having a drink or something, maybe you start swapping stories. And I had a lot of these anecdotes, which I realized if if you took them in totality, if you strung them together, 
um, they provided an unusual angle or an unusual window into the way Savannah used to be when I first moved here and mm-hmm. the way it was for the first couple of decades I lived here compared to how it is today. In other words, I like you said earlier, we both we love Savannah, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I've chosen to stay here yeah. you know, for a couple reasons. One, I didn't really have any money to go anywhere else, and I didn't want to do one of those uh, Bruce Banner, Incredible Hulk things where I just take a rucksack mm-hmm. on a stick and I go from town Off to town grid. and I say, yeah. I'm, I'm looking for an honest day's work, honest day's pay, because I'm not looking for an honest day's work, right? So uh, I didn't want to get into that. I stuck around here, but I, lo- I love the city because I made friends and I found uh, musicians to play with and writers and poets and artists and, and just good people to be around. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to try to find some way to get across to people the sense of loss that I feel for Savannah in this, in the sense that I it, agree. it because, because you when know, I first moved here in 96, um, there was a big alternative scene here. What do you, what do you mean by that? Exactly. Um, there were a lot of, uh, al- well, kind of like goth alternative type folks that I knew and some of the places, um, that you could go hang out for free, mm-hmm. you know, or on the cheap, you know, now it, I don't want to say, I don't want to knock anybody or knock any of the businesses or anything like that, but, I've seen prices go sky high. Um, well, in, in some respects, that's America. You know, that's yeah, your, it is. But 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 it's exaggerated here. Yeah, and you get um, well. There's a lot of uh, there. There's been a lot of change here in Savannah, and uh, you know, if you want to look at uh, a big one for me, I mean, the Starlin District. Mm-hmm. You know the, how that's kind of like a um, gentrified area now, where it used to be more of a predominantly poor neighborhood. And um, and then you have even from the gentrification, you have other businesses that are moving in there that are kind of high high end, mm-hmm. and um, they're moving out the folks that gentrified the area. Sure. And so you, you, there's a big change going on right now, you know, in Savannah. Well, there's a sea change, you know. Yeah. yeah. And and yeah. So I mean, the the thing that I the the things that I love about Savannah, okay, they're still here. Yeah, they still exist. Okay, yeah, they're still good but, people. But there. they're well, there well yeah, but, yeah, but of course, yeah. But but I, but the the attributes of the city, which I really love, um, they're still here. But compared to when I first came here, um, I just had the happenstance. It was just coincidence. Mm-hmm. I just had the good fortune to move here at a time when I was uh, quite young yeah. and impressionable, uh, uh, and and also at a time when I, you know I probably got here about I don't know sixty percent of the way through what you might call the golden age, let's say, of the Savannah counterculture, okay? Mm-hmm. So it was already going on before I got here. The, the real heart of it, right? Not not the manufactured thing that's going on right now. Right. So uh, I just happened to get here at that time along with a lot of other... Kind really, of the punk really, scene type? Not even... I wouldn't even say that, really. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, just, just, uh, uh, just a fringe... A counterculture, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it, that was not commodified. Okay, there was right. it was not there commodified. There was no like hot topic and stuff like that. Well, there was just no way to. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about mall stuff, but I guess uh, what I mean is there was just no way to. Uh, nobody was even thinking it was about more underground. It was an art scene, and, yeah. and I and I don't mean like an art school scene. I mean it was like an art scene, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, I, that's when I happened to get here, and yeah. that's a little bit of what I missed. Now that that realm is still there, but it's buried. But it's buried. Hang tight, real quick. Mm-hmm. I, I've got to do a station ID. Sure. We've got to do the um, the little break. All right, everybody. Um, you're listening to WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. This portion of WRUULP Savannah Soundings programming is brought to you by listeners and the Ships of the Sea Museum. The Ships of the Sea Museum is a member of the National Trust for Historic Preservation's Distinctive Destinations Program. The William Scarborough House is the earliest example of the use of Greek Revival architecture in the domestic setting, and this year is the 200th anniversary of the Scarborough House. Find out more about Ships of the Sea Museum at the website shipsofthesea.org. All right, and if you would like to sponsor us with an underwriting you can uh, go to wruu.org you can also just do an individual donation if you'd like um we had our pledge drive and we are constantly because we're a community radio station and it's volunteer um i i don't get paid for it. nobody here gets paid for it so wait a second wait what are you saying 
I, it was my understanding I was going to be paid a lot of money to be here. Today. Oh yeah. Uh, are you no, no seriously? Are you, are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I'm, I, I have. You I gotta have a, go. Well, I have a real. Pro- go I suddenly. have a real problem with this. <laughs> okay. I was. It was my understanding there was going to be. I mean, a lot of. I mean, heavy remuneration. Yeah. For this. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Yeah. It, so. Um, I'm just going to break my. I'm going to break my principles, and I'm going to stick you're around. Stick here. around. Yeah. Uh, well, we appreciate that. So, um, if you're listening at home, this is a great time to go on to wru.org and check out the website, and uh, you can hit the donate button if you'd like to give a dollar or whatever. So, thank you very much. So, Jim, yeah, uh, we were talking uh, right before the break about the uh, when you moved here. That was like kind of like a right in the heart of the counterculture scene. Well, yeah, I mean, there's always been one here, but I mean, there was a very particular one that was, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it's it's like this. Have you uh, so have you for all the listeners, I guess, or I'll ask you as well. But I mean, I can't hear their answers. You see, uh, have you ever lived in a house? that had a really bad bug problem, like a roach problem, an apartment or something. Okay. okay. So if you have, anybody who has, you know, like say you get up in the middle of the night, you're going to go to the kitchen, get a drink of water or something like that. And so you get up and you fl- flick that kitchen light on. And when you do, it's like, bam, right? And you've got... Like Joe's apartment, the old like movie. It's like Joe's apartment. Yeah. So you got all these... Bu- and they, they all freeze. Like all the bugs, okay, freeze. Um, and here's how it works. I mean, the way it works is the 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 dumber or the slower roaches, they wind up getting squashed, mm. right? The, okay. The faster or the smarter ones, they generally speaking, they sort of live to see another day, right? I'm not in, I'm just using this as a, okay. I, I'm not, in other words, I'm not casting an aspersion and saying that people from back then are dumb or slow, okay? Mm-hmm. And I'm certainly not smarter or faster, but for whatever reason, when 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 Savannah in the mid 90s, okay, the the confluence of John Barron's book Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil and the Forrest Gump when that movie came out, for the first time you have to understand that millions and millions of people all around the world, certainly hundreds of thousands and eventually millions, for a lot of them that book and that movie that was their first you know, exposure to Savannah. real cognizant exposure to yeah, Savannah. They right. could see it, they could see how beautiful it was, mm-hmm. and they read this book. And the book painted a very particular picture of Savannah. And it's not that the book was inaccurate. As a matter of fact, it was actually surprisingly accurate. Mm -hmm. But Barrett was only writing about a a small niche of Savannah culture. But to people who'd never really heard much about Savannah, as far as they're concerned, that was the totality of it, right? Yeah, Yeah, the Hollywood version. Well, well, no, I I don't mean that really. But I just mean it was he was focusing on oddball characters. Mm -hmm. Um, And what happened is... That is what the, the confluence of that is essentially what fueled our tourist industry today because we didn't have a tourist industry before. Right, we had tourists who would come every yeah, once in a while. Industry was completely different. But, in the but, 70s but we didn't have a, yeah, we didn't have a tourist industry. And so what <laughs> happened is when when all that happened and a lot of uh, a lot of European uh, a lot of uh, folks from Europe and other places and big mm-hmm. cities all started coming to Savannah. A lot of them came looking. They were specifically looking for the Savannah that Barrett wrote about. Mm-hmm. And they were, in fact, they were oftentimes looking for specific people he'd written about. And it was kind of like somebody had switched the light on above the kitchen light above the whole historic district, right? And what happened is a lot of the people who were unusual characters and oddballs, uh, many of whom I knew, we all knew, and, and I, you know, maybe I'm probably included in that, I suppose, myself. You know, a lot of those people uh, were very interesting people, mm-hmm. oftentimes because they were they were dealing with some personal demons. OK, right. they were they were in some way they were at a um, they were at a loss in some way. They might have had substance abuse issues. They might have been dealing with mental health issues. OK, down on their luck. Um, the beautiful thing for me about Savannah was that it was sort of a great equalizer. And when I first got here, what I loved about it is there were certain places in town you could go, and you spoke a little bit about this earlier in a way. You could go to like a place like Jim Collins Bar, which is no longer there, and you could sit at the bar. And in this little bar, right next to you on the bar, there would be a police officer sitting next to a homeless person, sitting next to the district attorney, Mm -hmm. sitting next to a stripper, sitting next to a SCAD professor, Skidding, sitting next to a, you know a, a city like a, a, a maintenance worker sitting mm-hmm. next to whatever a doctor and they're all sitting there and they all know each other and they all get along mm-hmm. and black and white y- you know young and old although old enough to be in the bar and uh, gay and straight and the whole thing and to me coming from an uh, overwhelmingly homogenous uh, I, I may not sound like it but I'm a hillbilly right mm-hmm. so coming from an overwhelmingly homogenous uh, rural part of Appalachian Tennessee this was stupefying to me and glorious, and I loved it. And I have a question on that part. 
<laughs> and that, that, that's just that's but that's just what I wanted to highlight. I wanted to let people. Well, kind of goes that, back to know, Buck. Kind of goes back to you being Buck's assistant. Well, that was just for a couple. Well, no, no, that no. Wasn't no very it's long. high school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you uh, you said you said that you thought maybe they they put you out of class because you talked a lot or whatever. I just didn't. I listen, man. I here's the th- I so, didn't I didn't fit in. You well, know? The, the, that's what I'm kind of getting at. Is yeah. like you found your people here in Savannah. Absolutely. My mother and my grandmother, uh, I wasn't able to come down and and tour. Yeah, I wasn't able to come down and tour the city or the school before I came here. I don't Mm -hmm. know why. It was a conflict or something. I wasn't able to. So my mother and my grandmother came down and they toured SCAD uh, and the city for a couple days and came back like on my behalf. And they Mm -hmm. came back to me and they said, hey. Uh, this city is beautiful. My mother had grown up in uh, Miami, Florida, and so she, uh, my father was from this rural part of Tennessee, but so she was from Miami and had been, you know, been big around. city. Well, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, yeah. But but the point is where I was raised. Okay, was this, and so my mom and my grandmother went down there and they came back and they said, "Listen, um, Savannah is beautiful. It's stunning. It's lovely. The people at the school are nice. The facilities are great." And they said, "My mom said to me in not so many words, or maybe in so many words, she basically said, your father and I realize." that this town that we're living in right now is not the town for you. Like, mm-hmm. like, you don't need to be here. This isn't, you need to get out of this town. If we think, you know, we think you would love this school and this city. And if you trust us, even though we don't have any money, or like we're, we're poor, but it's like if you, we'll take out loans, we'll do whatever we can. If you can get accepted to this art college and you want to go, we will do whatever we can to make sure you can go there. We think it's a good thing for you. And I took them at their word and I trusted them and I came here and from the very first day that I was in the city, I'd never seen it before. Mm -hmm. I saw a picture in the Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, I literally saw a picture of some Spanish moss and I read the little entry about Savannah. My mother and grandmother had like a Kodak disc camera. Do you remember the disc camera? No, but it, it would it would use it. It looked kind of like a ViewMaster. It would take uh-huh. film. It was, oh yeah, it was okay. terribly grainy and awful. And they came back with some blurry, grainy pictures of the squares. And I sh- so I showed up. I had no idea what I was going to find. And within three or four hours of being here, I realized I loved it. I've stayed here ever since. And I and I in my own little tiny whatever goofball way. Um, I, I try to be a champion for and a, and a proselytizer for the city. I, you know, I agree with that because um, I kind of feel like uh, I didn't move down here until I was 19. Mm-hmm. And I kind of feel like you grow up as a kid and then you grow up again as an adult, you know, and the, the second time you grow up as an adult, you know, you really kind of find yourself, you find your home and that kind of thing. You still have your kid, your childhood or whatever. Mm-hmm. But as an adult, I can identify with that uh, the same because, you know, I, I actually lived here. I moved here in '96, uh, the, the opening week of the Summer Olympics or the Olympics or whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, I lived here probably until December '97. I moved away. I met my wife in Wichita, Kansas, and I came back here in August of '99. And I've been back here ever since. Uh, the first time I lived here, it was okay. I, I didn't really enjoy it a whole lot. I used to. I, you know, like talking about the counterculture and like alternative scene or whatever. Mm-hmm. I used to always think, you know, it's not alternative if everybody's doing it. You know, it's not really mm-hmm. counterculture if everybody's doing it. Counterculture is kind of like, oh, well, everybody's doing, you know, X, Y, Z. So well, by I definition, don't. yeah. Right, right. But if everybody's doing that thing, then you're no longer counterculture. You're just kind of like following a trend. And uh, that used to be one of the things for me in the 90s. <laughs> but... I was never one. I've always liked art. I've always liked, you know, poetry and, and writing and that kind of thing. And I've always enjoyed artsy folks, you know, people that are creative and, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, I, you know, I don't necessarily think I was always an oddball, but I can definitely understand, like, with the talkative part, because I'm a talker. You know, I'm a talker, too. And, uh, well, you're a radio host. Well, that that kind of came after. But, but you know, you've all, I've always been a talker. And, and I understand how you, you're talking about with... You know, you kind of met your, you, you got here and you like, oh, I love it. And you've been here since. Mm-hmm. The second time I came to Savannah is when I, I kind of fell in love with it. And I was like, you know what? I like it. I want to be here. And since then, I'm, I am I try to, you know, do things, not necessarily be a champion for the city, but I do try to do things, you know, to give back to our community. You know, I do fundraisers and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. you know, I try to um, connect people, you know, that I know that like, hey, you're doing this and you're doing that. And I try to, you know introduce people and uh but that's one of the things i love about savannah is that there's such a, a wide uh demographic you know of, of folks that come from all walks of life um 
Well, there, and there are reasons for that. You know, yeah. I mean, there, I mean, you know, Savannah. A lot of people don't know, I mean, but you know, going back generations. You know, Savannah was sort of a, <laughs> Savannah was a bit of like a, a home for wayward girls and boys. Do you know what I mean? Right. Um, you know, Savannah, in some respects, is almost like the Australia of the East Coast. Um, y- you know, we, we got a reputation historically as a place where as long as you didn't, now this is an oversimplification, right? Um, because it doesn't include things like slavery. But generally speaking, this notion of like, as long as you don't hurt somebody else, you can kind of do what you want around here, okay? Now that's not I don't not an ironclad thing, but there's a there's a very Savannah has always had going back you know d- d- decades before I even knew of the town mm-hmm. uh, this uh, sort of a laissez faire type of an attitude, um, and a lot of that and it's, and so people would be sent here. I mean, if you had embarrassed your family or shamed them in some way, like here in the deep south or whatever, it wasn't unheard of that they would just say like you know here's some money, and initially it would have been like a a carriage ride and then maybe right. it would have been a train ride and right. there would have been a bus ticket and it's just like you know what you're just going to Savannah like we can't deal with you here <laughs> you know we're down here by the coast we're, we're, so we're tucked away we're not Charleston thank goodness mm-hmm. and so people would come here and it became kind of a depository for misfits okay and uh, the fact that we're a huge port city you have all these sailors you have people who come from all around the world and sometimes they're docked here for two and three days they get out they look around they love it they bring a little bit of their culture with them maybe when they retire they move back here Mm -hmm. Um, it's just it's a it's a really wonderful melting pot Um, and and it's also an oasis of in a sense it's kind of much like Austin Texas is like a little dot of blue in a sea of red Mm -hmm. you know I'm not going to tell you that Savannah doesn't have a lot of fundamentalist uh people and, and a lot of uh you know sort of ultra right wing people ultra conservative people right i'm not going to tell you there's not bad racism issues here i'm not right, going to tell you there's right. not classism okay but but by and large compared to the rest of the deep south we're a little bit like a little tiny drop of blue in a sea of red in the sense that there is a more open-mindedness i don't like to use the word um tolerance because it that implies you have to you're tolerating something yeah so yeah. i'll say like inclusion it's a little it's a little, it's a little bit more like you said open-minded and free-spirited i think I it's think. a lot more i think it's a lot yeah. more open-minded a lot more inclusive mm-hmm. and i think that all these different groups of people we have in town it's a you know we have lots of large vocal open uh distinct communities right yeah. uh ethnic communities uh religious communities what what have you but for the most part Cooler heads kind of prevail in times of crisis. Everybody pulls together to right. get along, and you don't see that in a lot of other deep southern cities. Yeah, I think uh, Savannah has a lot of charm and a lot to offer people. And I know folks that have moved here recently. Uh, I've got a couple of friends that they retired here, and they love it. You mm-hmm. know, and I know some other folks that they've come here, and you know, they hated it. You know, they, they it just wasn't for them. But a lot of times, the folks that didn't like it here, they were in like a bad situation or a bad relationship or. You know, they they came here for other reasons, and it's not that they didn't like Savannah. It's just that they They've were going through a connected it in their mind. Right. They've gone through a difficult time with their life. Well, so. when you have, like, sense memories and things like that can, can completely color your perception. Yeah. For, for example, in 1985, it probably was. So the little town I lived in, we didn't have any, uh, I mean, it was, it literally, it was like the area was like 98.2% white or something okay mm-hmm. right um and then of the remaining 1.8 percent uh of folks that were not caucasian you know something like 96 percent of them were black mm-hmm. right so th- there's like no ethnicities at the, at the time when i was growing up there right um it was a big deal when we got a taco bell hmm. this is like in 1985 it was like a big deal mm-hmm. like oh my god there's a taco bell right and uh this is just what you talking about sense memory it reminded me of this so like in 85 or something i went over to a buddy of mine's house um, and he lived in this little apartment that was, and it was such a strange apartment. I could never figure out what was going on with it. He, he paid like no money. I mean, it wasn't expensive to live in our town, right? Mm-hmm. But this apartment was in the basement of this big, tall red brick building sort of near our downtown. And it was, there were offices upstairs and mm-hmm. he lived in the basement and he paid something like a hundred bucks a month, I don't know, 75 bucks a month, something a little tiny apartment and it was so strange and I remember the first few times I was in there I didn't say anything to him but I kind of wanted to say like what well, dude what's up with your apartment because in the walls of his little basement apartment there would be these big cavernous um, almost like holes okay but they had been built that way designed that way these holes that were lined with uh, like white uh, tile like very s- sterile looking tile mm-hmm. and there were all these like, sort of strange metal uh, 
handles and things all over the place, kind of like you would see if you were going into like a handicapped or disability uh, access bathroom, like mm-hmm. grips and things. Anyway, I came to find out later on, the reason the place was so cheap is because it used to be the morgue. I was going to say, when you said the holes in the wall, I didn't, I didn't think of well, caskets well, he, he, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I didn't, well, bodies. And yeah. I didn't understand. He just put his dirty dishes in there and stuff, and, oh, wow. and maybe like his clothes yeah. and things. But I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And then, then once he said it, you go, oh, of course, this is the morgue. And it turns out it used to be the coroner's office upstairs. Yeah. Anyway, I remember going over there one day, and this fellow and I, we were in a band together. I was like 15, mm-hmm. something at the time. And, uh, the Taco Bell had just opened. It was like a big deal. I yeah. had not been there. I, I had heard of a Taco Bell that hadn't been there. And um, I get over to his house, and he had spent the last couple days huffing. Um, uh, it's like easy off oven cleaner. Yeah. So you take easy off oven cleaner, and you spray it in a paper bag, and you inhale it, and that's uh, you get your jollies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, it, but in this particular instance, I go over there, and he was really excited. Uh, he said, man, he goes, check this out. I've got something I've got to show you. And it turned out that a, a buddy of his had apparently, I think he had broken into, I, I, I'm not sure, but I think he had broken into uh, a veterinary office or some sort of like an animal hospital. And when he had uh, broken in there, he had actually stolen a little canister of, uh, I don't know the exact uh, chemical compound, mm. but essentially it was a canister of the fluid that they use the fumes from to uh, put cats and dogs to sleep. And he was very excited that they had this because it was something new for him to huff. Uh, You would think that it would be a very, very bad idea to intentionally inhale um, something that was used to anesthetize living creatures. Um, But I guess in his mind, he figured he was much bigger than a cat or a dog or something. Um, Anyway, to make this long story not that much shorter... um, he talked me into inhaling some of this material, which is used to kill animals. It was a very bad idea. Uh, generally, I shied away from stuff like that, but he was a very persuasive character. And plus, I didn't want the band to break up, and I thought, well, maybe this is you know, it's going to be a good idea to keep, keep the band together. So I uh, inhaled a bit of that, and I heard a sound in my ears. I had the, the sensation. It sounded like if you put your ear down to a bowl of Rice Krispies. You know, that was kind of like what I was, as a kid, I could relate to that. And uh, looking back, I assume now that what I was hearing was I was just hearing a, a chunk of my brain dying, sizzling or something. Wow. That's not really what I could have heard that, but that's kind of what it felt like. So uh, not long after we inhaled this, uh, this dog-killing liquid or something, uh, somebody says, hey, let's all go to this new Taco Bell. That was their idea. And we all piled into what I think, if I recall correctly, was some sort of a VW bug, like an actual VW bug. Mm. And we drive, it's late at night, and the Taco Bell was open 24 hours. And we go there, and I'd never been before. And we walk in, and it's garish, and it's bright. And again, the effects of this stuff, uh, you inhale it, it only, you only feel it for maybe, I don't know what, man, 90 seconds or something. You really mm-hmm. feel it. Um, and it was uh, incredibly euphoric, but then instantly hideously unpleasant. And so maybe like 45 minutes later, we wind up at the Taco Bell, um, never been there before. It's so bright. It's garish. Uh, they want to take our order. And I was just hit with the uh, the aroma of a Taco Bell, which I'd never experienced before. And in that altered state, um, it, it became very uncomfortable to the point of almost uh, hallucinatory. And I wound up having to leave the Taco Bell and becoming very ill. And then for many, many, many years uh, after that, uh, certainly couldn't ever think of going near a Taco Bell Mm -hmm. or being around someone who had food open from a Taco Bell. But even the mention of the word Taco Bell uh, was, uh, the words, I should say, it was very disturbing to me. And the only reason I bring that up is just to talk uh, a little bit about, you know, the the notion of a sense memory, somebody moving to Savannah and Mm -hmm. have a divorce or something maybe. I guess I can relate to that because of inhaling the cat killer and going to the Taco Bell. Yeah. <laughs> and we should probably mention at this point that the host left a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's gone. His son is here, but the host just was like, I'm out. He's gone. Yeah. I don't know uh, if he'll be back. Yeah, I'm going to play this this track, I guess it's called. <laughs> yeah. uh, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. This is Tyler Twomby from the album Chill Beats EP. What's that? Oh, sorry to hear that. Very sorry to hear that. I hope he feels better. Right. 